Good day, Rick. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. It's my pleasure, Guy, and uh, great to be en enrolled in the legion of people you've had do this video series. Yes, well, thank you. So this is, uh, this is actually video number 150, so I'm very pleased to have you as my special guest for this edition. Uh, let's start with, for our audience, I kind of want to walk you through you introducing yourself to our audience, for those that don't know you, but uh, let's start with, uh, where did you grow up? Well, and I didn't uh, fully introduce myself, so I'll start with that, and then that'll, we'll, uh, that'll uh, nicely tee into where I grew up, because where I grew up and how I got in the field, there's a very strong correlation between the two. Uh, so my name is, is Rick Rumler, and I'm a second generation performance improvement professional. Uh, my father was Dr. Gary A. Rumler. My uncle is another Rick Rumler, uh, who also was in the field working at, at Steelcase, so inside a company. And so both of them grew up in Michigan. And so like them, I also started out in Ann, Ann Arbor, Michigan. It was uh, there that my dad got, got his PhD at the University of Michigan, and uh, along with uh, Dr. George Ordiorn, formed the Center for Program Learning at the University of Michigan. And uh, that was really the, the origin, uh, whether I liked it or not, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the crib, I was, uh, became aware of many of the concepts that uh, people in the field know of now. And then uh, Later, after University of Michigan, my dad went to, well, he formed Praxis Corporation with uh, Dr. Tom Gilbert, uh, another notable name in the, in the field. And they formed Praxis Corporation and started out in New York City. And so in order to make New York City work, we moved from Ann Arbor, Michigan to New Jersey. And my dad commuted into New York City uh, until he and Tom Gilbert decided that enough was enough, and they moved Praxis out to Morristown, New Jersey, so closer to where we were already living. So most of my my formative years were kind of in split between Michigan and New Jersey, and that's kind of where where I ended up getting my my uh, my start working in in the in the basement of Praxis, stuffing notebooks, and occasionally looking to see what was on the pages that uh, I was stuffing into notebooks. Yes, I remember traveling out to visit with your father when I was an employee at Motorola and went to Summit and to the house and we would take breaks and walk around the block and then we'd get back to the front sidewalk and he'd say, you want to do that again? And so we'd take a second pass around <laughs> and, uh, and you and Carol Panza were working in the basement and uh, I guess... I think, was it Edie who was the secretary administrative person? Yes. And then yell at your father every once in a while for making updates to complicated drawings and things that she was helping him produce. It was a fun time. Uh, and then uh, I'm glad you mentioned your uncle, Rick, because when I first got into the business, the two people that I worked with had come from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Detroit, and they had worked with uh, your uncle, Rick, uh, and we're embracing all the stuff from Praxis. And uh, um, that's how I got kind of inundated into all of this, thankfully. I'm very thankful for all of this thing. Very good. But, uh, share with us, uh, so uh, where did you go to college and what did you study? So I went to Michigan State and uh, Business Administration, and I was a uh, curriculum, and I was a horrible student. Uh, I, I uh, struggled with, with classroom learning. And so I, I preferred actually my summer job, which was uh, working in, at that point, it, it, it was no longer Praxis Corporation. The next evolution of my dad's work consultancy was, uh, was well, for a time, Kepner Trago, and, but then it was uh, the Rumler Group. And so that's where I really uh, began working in the field was, uh, was as a member of the Rumler Group in Summit, New Jersey. And, uh, and so that's when I decided, well, I'd, I'd rather learn this way because I just found the tools that, uh, that my father was working with and Carol Panza and, and so many others as the field was growing then. They were, they're all tools for learning. Uh, and I, it was just an amazing way of being able to get in and, and pick the brains of subject matter experts, of 
from all different manner of domains and, uh, and, and, and learn. And that's always been kind of the, the I think the byword in, in, the, in the networks my dad formed and, and so much of, of, the, of the performance improvement community. It, you know, it's really about those who are avid learners and, uh, and then improvers as a result. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I remember uh, meeting you at uh, Motorola. I can't remember if we were at the Gould Center or the headquarters building, but in some conference room or something like that. And uh, uh, I, I hadn't appreciated at that point that you'd been actually working in the business here. And But the, uh, a very interesting story. So, so can, talk, talk to us a little bit about after that. So after the Rumler Group, I know you've had some very interesting clients, and so can you share with us anything about, you know, who you worked with and the kinds of things that you did? You don't have to go into anything that's proprietary or whatever, but you know, what what can you share with us? Yeah, so it, it was it, it was a very exciting time. So it, it you know it's 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 funny my you know you look at at, uh, at my dad's work, you know he he's always been teaching about the three levels of performance and and human process and and organization and human got expanded to be even both human and technology performers and so that kind of grew out and and the organization level became you know considering not just uh, the uh, the immediate uh, organization and structure but also the the business environment in which that organization sits so it got richer but it was all about looking at all the variables that impact performance at multiple levels but when I started in, in with the with the Rumla group, and then when Alan Brace came on, and we became the Rumla Brace group, uh, something happened, and it was the dawn of the process era, and Michael Hammer, and and business process reengineering, and all the excitement that happened, and then all all of a sudden, we were the only ones that had methodology, that had tools for understanding processes, and so you know the. The word was, if, if you want to get excited about it, you go see Michael Hammer. If you want to understand how to do it, you go, you go to the Rumble Brace group, right? And so at that point, you know, it was a new thing. And I was a, a young professional. And so, you know, thankfully, because it was a new thing, it was okay to send a young person, uh, you know, new and new. They go together. Uh, as opposed to an, an old established field, sending a young person, you would get questioned in a much more significant way. Uh, so I had the opportunity to just immediately jump into all kinds of uh, really interesting, complex process definition work. And we've always, what I've always enjoyed about process thinking is that you know you can see the people and you can see the organization, you can see all the other variables that impact performance. It just gives you a, a viewpoint or, or a vantage point for for looking at it. I know my dad used to think of it as you know looking at the at the knot hole in the fence. Right. Uh, to, and beyond that, you can see everything. So process kind of being the knot hole. And so some of the engagements were I mean, the very first one was at Union Carbide, actually looking at their recruiting process. And I learned chemies from Emmys. And, and uh, another interesting one was looking, working with the uh, uh, with the Norfolk, uh, Norfolk Southern Railroad um, and looking at the derailment response process. And learning that at the same time you're trying to clear a, a uh, derailment, you have to deal with safety issues. If, if was anybody hurt in the derailment, at the same time you're having to do what they do uh, an investigation. Was there somebody who, or were there criminal acts that went into this? And you're trying to do all those in parallel. And so trying to look at how those things work together uh, without conflicting uh, was, was unique. Did a lot of work within the nuclear power industry early on. And it continued to be involved in there because, as you would imagine, the processes are very important in nuclear power and a lot of coordination between a lot of swim lanes in terms of, you know, what needs to happen, especially when during the uh, outages uh, in, you know, in between uh, the reactors being up. And so it just gave me a, a, just an incredible opportunity to, to be involved in, in multiple industries. And that was, part of, you know, a huge blessing that it was not in one industry, it was uh, by having a methodology that can be applied to really any organization, whether it be public sector or private sector or 
or not-for-profit made no difference. And so I got involved in organizations of, of all kinds, whether it be high-tech manufacturing or petrochemical, um, adoption uh, organizations, uh, you, know, you name it, uh, government labs inside the Beltway, outside the Beltway. Uh, it just made for a very rich opportunity to understand multiple perspectives, uh, whether it be, and, and then within an organization, I came in pretty much every door you could imagine, you know, so I had HR as a sponsor for my work or as a client for my work, but I had IT and I, and I had marketing and I had manufacturing and I had customer service and I had C, you know finance and the CFO looking at financial processes. And so it really gave me the ability to talk to talk with anybody, which is which has just been a, a huge advantage so that I'm, I'm rarely, you know, there's, there's anytime you walk in through the doors of a new organization, there's a lot to learn. But there, all of a sudden, there was lots that I could assume that I'd seen in other places. You know, so your finance organization probably looks a lot like other finance organizations. Your HR organization probably acts a lot like other HR organizations. So I'm looking for the nuance and for the differentiations as opposed to learning things from scratch. Uh, and so I, I just the 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 body of what I've, what I've learned, I, it's hard to even categorize the, uh, the depth and the, and the breadth of, of what I've been able to get exposure to. And, and I think that, you know, the, uh, I was just came in with a methodology and a, a, a willingness to, or a desire to help them understand their performance. And then with that, I could work with them to improve it. So it was always part of the the approach is that it was it was always a facilitative approach to performance improvement, not a, you know, we're coming in as a subject matter expert going to tell you how, how it's supposed to be done. Yeah, I, that's one of the things I've really enjoyed about uh, my career in consulting is learning so much from so many different organizations and seeing some of the similarities. And I think that that's, you're right on here. You Once you begin to see some patterns, you can look for what differentiates this organization from other organizations, other functions. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I hearken back to, you know, uh, what's been captured on video of your father at Motorola in 81 talking about, you know, kind of really look at the process, understand the process first, and then look at all the variables because there may not be a process or there may be one that no one's actually adhering to. And so, you know, this is how you kind of get started, how you get grounded by the process. And uh, I've been, you know, it came naturally to me, but uh, I think to others, you know, it's something they need really need to focus on is beginning to understand that because that's kind of really what it's all about, if you will. Um, so what what happened after Rumler Brace? I know your father left Rumler Brace, but you stayed. And I think it was one of the, I don't know if it was one of your children or somebody else who said, hey, there's, you got to have a Rumler at Rumler Brace. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I was uh, uh, a senior consultant at Rumble Brace Group doing different projects. And then uh, there was an opportunity for us to go uh, global. Uh, and so we got, a, we got an invitation to establish a, an affiliate in, in Asia. And so I, I, was, I was volunteered uh, as a potential resource to go to Hong Kong and uh, help, help start up an affiliate there. And, uh, and that just gave an opportunity to Although we were uh, primarily servicing multi Western managed multinationals, still it's an opportunity to kind of see the Asian culture and, and how that plays into performance improvement, which was just you know, a, a tremendous opportunity. And, but while I was in, in Hong Kong, that's when Alan Brace and my dad decided to sell uh, the Romo Brace group. And, then, and so then he be began his, uh, his uh, two year semi-retirement, <laughs> not that he yeah. was ever able to fully retire, um, before he gave in and said uncle and, and got in, and uh, formed yet another consultancy, which was Performance Design Lab. And then, so I came back from, from Asia and, uh, and, and I, at that point, we relocated or actually located anew to Charleston, South Carolina, where I've been for the last 22 years. And, uh, at that point, uh, worked a little bit with Rumble Brace Group and its new ownership, and then went out on my own for a little bit. And then ultimately, I thought, well, let's let's keep a good thing going. So I rejoined my dad in, in Performance Design Lab, 
uh, along with uh, Sheree Wilkins and Alan Ramis. And so we became the four partners in, in Performance Design Lab. Uh, for a little bit there, we, we had Kimberly Morrill working with us, uh, Dale Brethauer's daughter, and uh, as well as uh, uh, my brother, uh, Matt Rumbler. So in Performance Design Lab. And so then we were off on the next, the, the next frontier of, of applying performance improvement theory and, and concepts and principles and, and doing more good work. And so that's kind of where, so it was, it was performance design lab up until the time my dad passed away in 2008. So that's 2001 to 2008. And then uh, Sheree and Alan and I continued performance design lab for a few years after that. And then uh, before we all kind of went to, went our own ways and uh, still keep in contact and, and, and all still doing good work. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, so you're, but you're still doing performance improvement kind of work. What, what can you share with us uh, with, with what you're doing lately? Yeah, very much so. So I actually had an opportunity to get involved in a healthcare startup. Uh, in you know, healthcare is an interesting field and in that it's, it's, a uh, it's very siloed for, for, for good reasons and for, and for not so good reasons. Um, uh, as are many industries, but, uh, but healthcare is, is uh, at the top of the list of, of uh, naturally siloed. And so it was never a, a focus area, but he had an opportunity to get involved in a startup, which is really a fun thing. You know, we'd, we'd always talked about whether our concepts and tools could be applicable to venture capitalists, you know, who were trying to understand the, the, the value and the performance of those things they're looking to invest in. And we always thought there should be a connection. This was really the opportunity to say, let's prove that connection. Let's actually use the concepts and tools to actually design from scratch uh, what a, a business could look like that provides uh, hyper-specialty healthcare. And so I was involved in designing that business and, and supporting them going out and raising capital and seeing how how the tools that we work with, how it allows really the valuation because the, there's much, there's much more, it's not a slideware, right? It's, it's a firm understanding of this is, this is how we're going to operate and this is how we're going to grow this business using the tools that we work with. And guess what? The valuation of the companies goes up. And, and so it was great being part of the launch of that, of that business. So I actually joined them as an employee for five years. And uh, just recently uh, left, and now I'm uh, continue to consult back to that company, uh, as well as other hyperspecialty healthcare. Uh, also working with a bank in Asia, uh, and also working with a, a startup uh, health registry and cannabinoid business uh, right now. So, uh, what they have in common are either they're all startups or they're all or there's a turnaround. So either way, it's the opportunity to look at whole enterprise and all the variables that, which is just, just very exciting. Yes, I can imagine. So this, I, I have a feeling that you're going to also be a failure like your father and that you're never going to be able to retire. You'll just keep on going until the end. I suspect, although it doesn't, doesn't keep people from asking the question over and over again. Are you still working? But like, <laughs> why, yeah. would I, why would I stop? Well, exactly. I mean, it's, it's fun. It's interesting. I mean, it's just keeps you engaged. I mean, what else are you going to do? You know, maybe you have a hobby or something, but uh, this is life's work. That's uh, very meaningful. And I, I think you probably get a lot of enjoyment out of it. the people that I know that have, that were in that business, you know, that's what they did forever until the end. Um, so let's see. So this next question here is about, tell us a little bit about your first exposure to HPT human performance technology, or otherwise known as evidence-based practices for performance improvement, or a dozen or so other names. Uh, but what can you tell us about your first exposure and understanding of that? And, and by the way, what do you call it? Uh -huh. Very good. Uh, interesting question. What have I called it? You know, <laughs> maybe better to say, what haven't I called it over the years? But uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I started out, my very first formal exposure was as a teenager going to an ISBI conference, I think in Boston, 
Um, and I went to a few before I figured out that I might actually be working in the field and, and met all kinds of great people. I mean, of course, just hanging out at, at Praxis Corporation, being able to, to bump into would be Tom Gilbert or, um, gosh, there, there were there was such a great, a, a fun place. Um, but yeah, Frank Anderson, Carol Bocchino and, and, uh, and so many others at, at Praxis Corporation. Um, but it really became kind of who was in my, in my father's network at, at, at any given time. And it was always a, a, uh, a large network. Uh, it's been interesting just kind of trying to, trying to keep on top of his mailing list that he developed over the, over the years. Uh, you know, ultimately I think where we came out and we actually did a chapter on, on it in one of, in one of the books is, uh, is performance architect is the best way we could come up with for describing what we did. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll sometimes flip to performance architect and performance engineer um, so that there really, there really is an active engineering role to what we do. Um, but it's hard to, to call it, it's, it's not just human, it's not just technology, it's not just process, it's not orga just organizations, it's all those things working together and ideally in harmony to, uh, to create value. For, for a business. And that really is the, the, the driver for what we're doing. But there are so many good people with uh, the, uh, all the Rumble Brace Group consultants had a chance to work with. And so Alan Brace being top of the list and you know, a great mentor to me um, and, uh, and, and many others. And, and then, you know, the, the ISPI crowd, which was always a, a, a constant in my dad's work. Um, Although the you know the the varying understanding of uh, understanding and misunderstanding of his of his becoming a process guru, um, you know, and was was he leaving the human performance field? But uh, most got it and uh, and appreciated it. Yourself and, and Roger Addison and and then later Klaus Whitcomb and and. Uh, Dale Brethauer, so many great colleagues that, uh, that I still know as friends, Mark Munley, uh, and uh, just, a, just a great crowd. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a good group. I, I remember talking to your father about, uh, you know, when ISPI, which was NSPI back in the day, the National Society for Programmed Instruction, when the thought leaders of that group in the mid sixties realized that they could have stellar instruction, but it wasn't really changing much. And so they began to look at the other variables and a lot of people then kind of went their own way and created their own language for their things, which had more in common with each other than not. And it took a while for that group, including your father to get together. It was a group called the Tucson seven back in the early two thousands where they got together and started comparing, you know, how they went about what their methods were, et cetera, and realized that there was a lot of commonalities and, and there were things to learn from each other. Um, because I think that what they were experiencing at ISPI at that time was there was nothing there for them. They were a source for people, but they weren't really getting, uh, stimulated intellectually, you know, with other people's approaches until they formed this special little group and began exploring some of uh, each other's work. But um, um, so, so we know that your one of your biggest influences is obviously going to be your father and some of the names that you've already mentioned. But so my question is to help point others to sources, people, or resources, articles, and books and things, but, but can you share with us some of the more meaningful things to you personally, professionally, that you would perhaps want others to consider taking a look at? Mm. You know, so, so much of, uh, of our, the recent thinking has been about how to create value and, and how to define value. And so, I, you know, two of the most impactful things I've I've ever read. One is, uh, is Michael Porter, uh, Harvard Business School. His his paper and and books on strategy, and in particular his paper on called "What Is Strategy," huge uh, influence on me in terms of understanding what is competitive advantage. You know, is is, is what is a sustainable competitive advantage? Because that's value. 
right? If, you know, a competitive advantage is not sustainable, is not, is not sustainable value. And so you really have to work back from why is this in its marketplace uh, a, a, a successful entity? Um, and, and even for nonprofits and public companies, you know, there's, there's always alternative providers, you know, so, mm-hmm. you know, among alternatives, what makes you stand out Whether you know, if competition is not, not the appropriate term in concept, it's still applicable. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was always very important. And, and then I, I really enjoyed uh, Thomas Friedman's The World is Flat. Um, it really uh, got me and us. I mean, you, you know, what always defined those books and articles as special, the ones that got passed around and, and became the source of, you know, the, our view of the world is flat, our view of what is strategy. Um, and Friedman really did a great job of, of, of bringing forth stories about people challenging what is the value. You think that's the value you're bringing, but is that really the value you bring? Maybe it's this other thing. And, and, and looking at ways of combining, if you put your value with their value, then you create uh, additional value and you create more, more sustainable value than you would have on your own. So it became a great partnering model. And that's really been a great source for thinking about how, to, how things work in a startup world because startups, especially when you're talking with venture capitalists, they're always looking at how can I put this startup with this startup to create more startup value, right? So it's that, and that really unlocked, uh, unleashed that whole thought process for, you know, how, how do you define value? How do you see value? How do you look for it? And that really became the, the key to us really saying, you know what, we need to step back and really think about how we've even defined what a process is for, for decades. And we, we kind of fell into the traditional definition of process and we realized process is not a series of activities that results in an outcome. Um, it's, it's the opposite way. It's a unit of value and it's all the work that goes into creating that value. That's what the process is. And whether... And so if there's no real value, then there's no real process. I don't care what, whether, you're, you know, there may be work there and people who are doing it, but if it's not producing value, then it's, it's not a, uh, a process of any, of any real value. Uh, and that was, was, the, was the key to, to really evolving our understanding of process that became uh, really central to the, the last book on, on, uh, on, on process, uh, which was the White Space Revisited. And uh, which was which was so important to kind of get that out there as the the update on our understanding of process, but it also kind of helps cement really understanding that process is really a translation layer between people and technology and organizations and businesses. And it's not that it's more important, but I, if I can't make that linkage between what the technology does and what what the people are doing and where the business is trying what the business is trying to get done, then I'm, I'm not going to succeed. And so it's, and so the beauty of process is it is that layer. Uh, and it is easier to define than most, most organizations you know, with the very fluid organization structures and, and uh, strategies and goals and, and the many people and many technologies uh, that go into making it all tick. So it, it's uh, just been a great a great vantage point. So there's been a lot of a lot of books that have helped us kind of better understand that translation layer notion. And so we got had to get smarter about uh, data architecture and technology architecture because that's really part and parcel to the process architecture that's in that translation layer. Right? You can't you can't uh, just just understanding the workflow doesn't necessarily define the data, but the data without the workflow doesn't get you there either. And then, and then what's the technology that's carrying that data and that whether, whether our, whether the users care for the technology or not, you know, they're, they have to live with that technology. And so, you know, really understanding and appreciating all the complexity that comes with them with any modern business was, and being able to articulate it and break it down for others to understand. Um, there's so many people who, who have, you know, influenced because they it all comes together into one single understanding, um, and and so just appreciative for 
all the different topics and, and uh, authors and people who have guided us to them. For people that are kind of uh, getting their toe in the water with uh, performance technology, performance improvement, what of your books where you were an author and or your father's books, where would you start them? What's a good starting place for somebody that's a, more or less a novice in this world? Yeah, de definitely the place to start is, is uh, managing the white space on the organization chart. Uh, uh, sorry, full title being performance, improving performance, managing the white space on the organization chart. Uh, my preference is a second edition. There have been, there've been, been three editions. The third edition was, was, uh, was put out by the new owners of, of the Rumble Brace Group. Mm -hmm. But the last that Gary Rumler and Alan Brace signed off on was the second edition. Uh, and, and that is a, a incredible synthesis of his first 25, 30 years of consulting. It, it mm -hmm. really summarizes perfectly the whole human, uh, the human performance system and, and its linkage to process and linkage to organizations, linkage to strategy. It's just a, a great summary work. And it, it's uh, still the models and tools there are the people don't, many people don't realize is the basis for pretty much any modeling or mapping program you've got out there. So Visio and, and now all the cloud-based versions of Visio, all those, all most of the core models that they use for, for modeling performance, whether it be cross-functional process maps or function relationship maps under different names were first really set forth as a, as a tool set in that book. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then for me, I, the, the opportunity then to revisit and to really challenge the def, uh, the definition of process and how to think about process as part of a larger process architecture, uh, is what really made the, the, the update, which is uh, waste space revisited. So, so meaningful, some 20 years after, after, uh, improving performance management, the white space was, was written. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, uh, you know, I can I can say that I was uh, in the off. I, I I was still I well I was had started in the field and in the office when the manuscripts were being passed forth between Gary Rumler and Alan Brage for the first one, and then uh, just very very appreciative that I was able to be a co-author of the of the follow up. I will put uh, in the show notes to the YouTube video links to those books out on Amazon and they're available elsewhere as well. But uh, but we'll we'll point people to those because I think that they are great resources. Let me shift gears here a little bit and uh, ask you if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech on what it is that you do to provide an example with others about how people can give a short and sweet definition of, you know, what is it that they do? What would your 30 second elevator speech be? So I, I tend, tend to say I'm not, uh, I'm not an innovator of, of, of how performance works. I'm a clarifier of how performance works. Um, so I take great ideas and convert it into something that is replicable and, and operational or operationalizable and then potentially scalable, uh, which, is, which is so important to in the startup space. And so, you know, I become the translation layer for the designers and the great thinkers and the people who actually need to carry out that, that, that thinking. Um, so that's the reason why I tend to think of myself as the performance engineer or the performance architect. You know, I need to be able to say, how do, how do I bottle what others either have created and are trying to figure out how to articulate to others or are designing and are struggling with how to articulate to others. Uh, the ability to communicate how performance is to happen is so important. Uh, and I think that's a huge value. And, and then the other part that goes into, to that with that is, and what's the value that we're creating as a result of that? So it's not just the how, it's also the why. The why being the value and the how being how we create that value. Excellent. Thank you for that example. Uh, shifting gears again here. As a lifelong learner, where is your current focus or next focus for learning? And are you writing anything about that? And where could people see that? So first of the two-part question here, what is it that you're focused on for your learning? And is there, are you sharing that in any way? Yeah, that's a great point. I'm, I'm, uh, 
very much the focus right now is on is on startups and uh, and healthcare in particular, and really trying to get better at reinventing uh, or how we how we reimagine how an organization should work. What are the piece parts that uh, what what what's the first thing you need to think about in terms of designing an organization? What's the second thing? What's the third thing? Is there a logical sequence? Um, we know one of the early steps is going to be defining whether it be the customer journey, the patient journey, or the or the or the member journey. There's a journey which defines the core value, which should be at the heart of it. And then, but then, what has to be in place to support that, and what has to be in place to manage and and, and oversee that? So, being the that's what what uh, has got me very excited right now is is uh, being able to um, think about how to create that approach to a new business. Um, and I'm not writing about it uh, or, or sharing that learning. And uh, at some point I'm, I'm going to want to, I know, uh, but I'm trying to do enough of it that I can see a pattern. Uh, but what's, what's amazing is how much of the, the methodology and tools learned over the last 30 years just naturally dovetail into, into that work. So in some ways it's, it's nothing new. Um, but in other ways, it's something very new for me. It's just applying it in a different way to a, to a different need. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And I am looking forward to whatever uh, will come out of you uh, writing-wise and uh, sharing with others um, what you've learned and uh, how people can, uh, can glean onto that and uh, you know, help to improve their practices in this world. Um, my next question is, uh, and this is always a favorite or people's least favorite question, is there a performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued and you want to put your own spin on it, but what term or phrase would you share with us? Well, definitely the one that comes to mind is the de what, what is a process? You know, we, we, we all kind of assume a definition of process, you know, it's how things get done. It's, it's, you know, follow the work. It's, it's, a, um, it's a string of activities. Uh, you know, think of, of, you know, SIPOC models, right? It's a, uh, if you've got an input and you got an output, the uh, process is everything in between. Um, and that's a very, uh, non value way of thinking about process. Um, and so, you know, the, uh, we just encourage everybody who, who hears this to you know, reconsider uh, what the definition of a process is. I mean, it's, it's all the work, irrespective of who does it, where it gets done, when it gets done, how it gets done, the performers of that, whether it be technology or people or, or third party um, contributors, all the work to create value, to create a unit of value. And so and then it's very important to think about processes in the context of an architecture because uh, the, the customer of a process is the next process. And the customer of that process is the next process. It ultimately, if you don't understand the architecture of, of processes inside, inside a business or organization, you're going to have a hard time understanding any one process. Yeah, it's within the context of a value chain. Uh, thank you for that. All right, so my uh, kind of wrapping up question, uh, well, I have two, so this is the second to the last, but uh, again, as a way to share with others our, in our audience, you know, who's who, and but, so I'm looking for any shout outs from you about people in the field uh, that you wanna draw some attention to so that others might uh, check up on them and see what, what they may have produced. Um, but uh, who do you think that others should be influenced by who that we haven't mentioned thus far uh, or mentioned anything specific about them, but uh, who would you call out? Boy, there's, there's, uh, there's so many and, and they're all relevant. And that's the, and that's the hard part is that, you know, you, you really can't, you know, you can dismiss this school. You can, don't worry about that. Just focus on, on this. So, you know, you, you go way back to starting with, with, uh, with Deming. And and Duran and the quality principles are are wholly principle are wholly applicable. Um, 
all of the, the, the gurus and pioneers in human performance would be Tom Gilbert and, and uh, Mal Warren and, and, and uh, George Ordiorn and, and you know, so many others in, in, uh, in, that, in that area. Uh, from a business process perspective, the Paul Harmons and, and so many others uh, and the Michael Hammers and, and uh, uh, Roger Broughtons and, and folks in that space. Uh, there are so many, I, and I think the, the key thing for me has been to encourage every, anybody and everybody to just become a collector of models that, that they've developed for, because they all have value for understanding performance. And so, you know, and, and so the biggest thing I see is the uh, biggest frustration with working with people from a performance improvement standpoint is people who get stuck on a model, on a approach, right? Six Sigma being a great example of, you know, incredibly powerful set of tools, but you, you get people who are uh, black belt blockheads, right? And that, that's, you know, that's, that's the one thing they're going to apply to any performance improvement need. And the same thing is true, whether it be, from, you know, in the, in the very beginning, the training is a solution for all performance improvement needs. And so, you know, I, my guidance is to be open to all the schools of thought and, and it'd be a collector of models that will help you understand it and, and convey it back to the people who are trying, who are wrestling with it. Um, you know, a, a picture is, uh, is worth a thousand words and that's always been a mantra for, for my father and for myself. If you can't draw a picture of it, you don't understand it. And so having, you know, visual models, whether they be um, as simple as the uh, plan, do, check, act as a way of organizing thinking to uh, performance plan, performance execution, performance managed, you know, there are just some great basic models and uh, so just encourage you to collect models. Thank you. That is really kind of an answer to this last question, but I'm going to ask it nonetheless. So thanks for participating with me in this video interview. But my final question is, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially those new to the field? I think it's a complex field to enter into. And so what guidance would you share with people who are new to this world? So I guess there's, there's two thoughts. The first is always think macro to micro. So, you know, the, the context that surrounds the issue or the need or the opportunity you're looking at is always meaningful. And, and you are always at some risk of being unpleasantly surprised if you don't understand the context in which that performance situation is happening. Even if you can't influence it, you need to understand it or at least understand enough about it to understand how it impacts what you're trying to change. Um, so macro to micro has, has always been key. Um, there's so many efforts that, that, uh, have failed because they tried to work the other way. You know, let's, let's work micro to macro and it just doesn't work. And the other one is, is, uh, is follow the value. Um, always seek to understand what's the value we're trying to create. What's the value that's not getting created if there's an issue. Um, uh, and, and how do I know how that value is valued downstream? Um, so recognizing that, that, you know, systems theory and, and the notion of looking at organizations and systems says that it's all one big system and you have limited ability to, to understand the entire system of the entire organization or the entire business or the entire business ecosystem. But, uh, the more you can understand, the better off you are. And, uh, so never hesitate to ask questions about value it's a it's always a thought-provoking question inside organizations and you get uh, you get great points for asking people questions that they actually have to think about i like those both of those thank you so much for that rick thanks for sharing with us today i i very much appreciate you taking the time to uh to be with us and uh, thank you for all your good work and i'm looking forward to uh, continuing to follow your good work as we go forward Thanks. My pleasure. And thank you for, for keeping this field going and uh, under its many names. I appreciate knowing that, that uh, you're at, on the, the, the keel of making this, uh, making this industry go. And because uh, we, we struggle to define ourselves, but uh, as people like yourselves, we're like, I don't care what it's called. We're just going to, we're going to, there is a history that's worth keeping and there, and there is a future that's going to, that's going to keep evolving. So thank you for your work. You're most welcome. Cheers.
Cheers.